Chapter 28 Assignments James and Rat's brutal paddling was the only surprise of Lauren's first day inside the Ark. The Survivor School taught regular subjects, in classrooms that were air-conditioned and equipped with computers and modern textbooks, although the outside world was cut off. The computers didn't have internet access, and there was no TV, magazines or newspapers. There was a heavy emphasis on rote learning of passages from the survivor's manual, and you were out of luck if you wanted to know about anything that had happened since World War I in history class. Lauren hadn't spoken to James, so she didn't understand why her job in the kitchens got pulled after half an hour. She was told to abandon her rubber gloves before getting reassigned to a cushier job as an office assistant. She found herself working alongside Rat, and her main duties were retrieving files, passing messages, and making coffee for the adults. The low point of the ARC routine was undoubtedly the food. Lunch had been a gritty pasta salad with black olives, which were one of Lauren's pet hates. Dinner was a dried out baked potato sitting in a puddle of baked beans, followed by vanilla ice cream and a square of sponge cake that had all the culinary virtues of a seat cushion. As always, there was plenty of sugar rich orange juice and cola to keep up the youngsters' energy levels. The school didn't give homework. So after the early evening service, Lauren spent time playing skittles and basketball before getting introduced to a bunch of weird skipping and chanting games. The other girls were polite and ready with hugs and compliments for the new girl, but their words and smiles seemed flat. Lauren began to imagine that she might be able to peel off their faces and uncover a robot army with flashing diodes and microchips inside their skulls. Lauren's second morning at the Ark began with a shout shortly after sunrise. She felt a sense of dread as she forced open gooey eyes. The survivor's schedule was relentless, and Lauren knew she wouldn't get a rest until she returned to bed in 16 hours' time. On top of that, she couldn't see a clear path forward for their mission, and was worried about what would happen over the coming days especially when every chance they took meant running the risk of a paddling. The girls around her were already out of their beds, pulling on the grubby kit they'd worn for sports the night before. Come on, drowsy, a girl called Verity said brightly. It's a new day. The Lord has set challenges for us. The words reminded Lauren of the sickly phrases you get inside cheap birthday cards. She would happily have told God to stuff his challenges in return for a couple of hours lying in bed watching bad TV, followed by a lazy session pottering around a kitchen, whipping up her favourite pancakes stuffed with Nutella and icing sugar. Still, Lauren had a job to do. She pulled on her stinking yellow socks and rugby shirt before peeing and chasing the other girls outside onto the exercise yard behind the accommodation blocks. James was already there with the blues, lined up beside Rat. Lauren was desperate to speak to her brother, but girls and boys slept, ate, learned, worshipped and played separately, so it wasn't going to be easy. There was no opportunity during the exercises, nor in the formation lap that followed, but she finally got a chance as they broke free to run the high-speed laps of the compound. How's your butt? Lauren asked, deliberately keeping her speed down so that they dropped behind the charging hordes. James was out of breath. My ass is black and blue, but it looks worse than it feels. Were you really perving at girls in the shower? It's a long story, James said, not wanting to repeat it because it made him look dumb. More importantly, the guy I got paddled with is Joel Regan's son. You and me need to meet up so I can explain properly. The earliest will be tonight, Lauren said, 
We can sneak off during sports time, between the buildings or something. They turned a corner and heard a sharp popping sound. Lauren immediately stopped running and hopped on one leg, as though she twisted her ankle. James thought she was really injured. He stopped and turned back anxiously. Are you okay? Lauren spoke through gritted teeth. Look around, idiot head. It's the signal from John. With all that was going on, James had forgotten that John was going to try and get the miniature radios to them. It made perfect sense for it to happen at a corner because the runners ahead of them had no reason to look backwards and the runners behind would be blindsided by the corner. As Lauren sat down on the pavement, ripping off her trainer and clutching her foot in mock agony, James scoured the floor. He noticed a golden cigarette packet at the edge of the tarmac path that clearly had no business in the middle of the outback. James realised the pot must have been caused by something firing the carton from between a couple of boulders a few metres away. As he snatched the packet, he had to unhook a nylon cord that must have been there to wind the carton back if things had gone wrong. He tucked the cardboard pack inside his shorts and wondered how it had managed to get where it was and pop out at exactly the right moment. But there wasn't time to stand around trying to figure it out because a couple of stragglers and a teacher who always ran at the back had just turned the corner. Lauren stood on one leg leaning against the arc's perimeter as the moustache teacher stopped running and smiled at her. What's the matter? Uh, I put my foot down funny and went over on my ankle. I don't think it's bad, though. Dana staggered in from her run around the Brisbane Mall. She always finished half a lap ahead of the other girls and was surprised to see Abigail standing outside of the shower room waiting for her. I'm out working all day, Abigail explained hurriedly. They're really busy over at the warehouse. I got these off Michael last night. Who's Michael? He's our liaison with Asus, now that John and Chloe have headed off to the Ark. Abigail passed Dana a rectangular white strip, which looked like a small bookmark. Fat lot of use that'll be to me. Dana said sullenly. I just hope James and Lauren got theirs okay. Apparently they've rigged up a gadget using a radio controlled buggy with a video camera and a hydraulic gun mounted on it. Dana half smiled and shook her head. James Bond, eat your heart out. A couple more runners had finished and were heading into the changing room. As Abigail turned and hurried away, Dana gave them her sweetest survivor smile. Great work, girls. Oh, thank you, Dana, Eve said as she swept her long red hair off her face. Instead of going into the shower, Dana locked herself into a toilet cubicle. She sat down and slid the radio out of its bag. It was flexible, less than a millimetre thick and five centimetres long. The back had a small solar panel, like on a calculator, and two flat buttons, an on and off switch, and one you had to press down to transmit. She folded open a narrow sheet of instructions. Ultra low power, multi-spectrum transceiver. Range, under two kilometers. Battery life, two hours. Solar panel recharge, 12 hours. Quick charge. 15 minutes of bright sunlight will provide 10 minutes of emergency talk slash receive. Conserve power by leaving the unit off when not in use. Keep transmission time to a minimum. Dana scrunched the instructions up and popped them in her mouth. Once they turned into a soggy pulp, she spat it into the toilet and flushed. She felt miserable as she slipped off her trainer peeled out the insole and hid the radio beneath it. Dana had finished with top marks in every piece of cherub training she'd done, yet she'd never gotten the brakes on any of her missions. 
Dana didn't want to hate James and Lauren. They were good agents and nice people, even if James was full of himself at times. But she was going to be stuck at the mall while they were getting all the glory inside the ark and she couldn't help resenting it. Especially Lauren. She already had her navy t-shirt and she was 11 for God's sake. There was a bang on the door, followed by Eve's voice. Are you okay in there? Dana gritted her teeth. The survivors didn't even like you getting five minutes to yourself on the toilet without making sure you weren't having any negative thoughts. I'm wiping my ass, Dana said irritably, struggling to contain her anger as she pulled her trainer back on. Oh. Eve said, disturbed by the graphic description. It's just that Wayne wants to see us after school, so don't go to your work assignment today. Dana remembered Lauren's comment about Wayne having a plan for her, but she was way too cynical to get her hopes up. She poked out her tongue and gave Eve the finger behind the toilet door as she replied cheerily, Thank you for telling me, Eve. I'll look forward to that. James asked around and found out that a paddling was a rare event for any kid who didn't go looking for trouble. Most of his roommates had been at the school for years and had only received a standard dose of a dozen licks on a couple of occasions. Still, while the paddling had made James's introduction to life inside the ark painful and shocking, it had formed the basis of a valuable friendship with Rat. After a morning of lessons, a poor excuse for lunch and the afternoon service, James was hitting his stride and felt a lot more confident as he walked down a sunlit path for his second day of work and met his boss Ernie along the way. Howdy partner, Ernie said, clapping his hands happily. Yo. James answered enthusiastically. Ernie was a lively man in his 60s who'd sold his home, abandoned a bunch of rowdy teenage kids and switched to the survivor lifestyle. You could have put him on a survivor's poster. Handsome and bronze-skinned with a bushy moustache. The sort of man you'd expect to see playing a friendly grandfather in a TV commercial. Ernie drove a delivery truck which took letters and parcels to a post office in a one-shop town a hundred kilometres to the east. He'd never had an assistant before and had no idea why he'd suddenly been given one, but Ernie wasn't the sort to ask questions and seemed perfectly happy having James for company. The delivery van lived beneath the canopy of a vehicle compound alongside two dozen other cars and commercial vehicles, including Joel Regan's Bentley, and the bulletproof limo he'd used for public events when he was in better health. The sacks of mail ran down a metal chute from the adjacent offices. James and Ernie grabbed the sacks two at a time and hurtled them into the back of the truck. Ernie took the driver's seat and floored the gas pedal as soon as they passed through the vehicle gate in the turret. Ernie claimed that there wasn't a speed trap within 500 kilometres and cruised at 150 kilometres an hour, which was about as fast as the truck would go without things getting seriously hairy. As they jiggled and clattered over badly cracked tarmac, James sat in the passenger seat, watching the plume of dust they were throwing up in the door mirror. It was good to have a couple of hours in his schedule to chill out. Just a pity they weren't allowed a radio, because a few tunes would have made it perfect.